you let me know when you feel like starting. Yeah, okay. Let us start. Well, thanks for joining us today. We're, we're joined by Dr. Barry Goodall from the University of Wisconsin-Madison to speak with us about Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So Dr. Goodall, please take it away. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, uh, my name is Barry Goodall. I'm a professor of pharmacy at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, my area of work is uh, specifically in adult epilepsy. My uh, area of research is in anti-seizure medication, pharmacokinetics, um, and dynamics, and I've got a particular interest in drug interactions. And my clinical practice is at the Madison VA. So here's what I would uh, like to um, do tonight. Uh, first of all, well, let me thank Equestive uh, Therapeutics for making this evening uh, possible. Um, what I'd like to do tonight, I'm, I'm realizing that I'm speaking to an audience that probably has a, a great deal of familiarity uh, with what is epilepsy. I'm, I'm really going to talk about, kind of focus in on some of the challenges with Lennox-Gastaut um, syndrome, and then talk about some uh, kind of specific treatment issues with Lennox-Gastaut, and maybe some new technologies, drug technologies, that uh, can kind of help with some of these challenges. So that's my agenda tonight. Now, uh, just to put this into pers some perspective, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny when I talk to uh, different audiences, um, I sometimes hear people say, well, you know, gee, epilepsy is a pretty rare thing. And, um, you know, I think I suspect, and when I've talked to patients and the uh, caregivers or significant others, of patients with epilepsy, sometimes they feel like they're alone, that this is, um, especially when we talk about something like Lennox-Gastaut syndrome that always has the word rare, uh, you know, syndrome somewhere attached to it, that actually we talk about epilepsy itself, it's really not a rare event. Um, you know, there's three and a half million people in the United States that currently have epilepsy. And as we know that the demographics are changing, specifically as our population gets older, um, we're going to see more and more people with epilepsy. But, you know, it, in particular, when we talk about Lennox-Gastaut, we'll talk a little bit more about the demographics of that. Um, it's actually not as extraordinarily rare as some people think it is, primarily because sometimes it's not been recognized um, when it was in childhood. And then as a person ages and grows up, they don't necessarily get that correct diagnosis. So again, um, it, this is one of the wonderful ways the Epilepsy Foundation is, is able to help um, patients and providers, I would argue, is that to let you know that it, you're not alone and that there are resources out there. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk a little bit about um, the challenges of, of seizures and, and, and of epilepsy. And one of the things, I just alluded to this, about the number of people um, that have epilepsy. Well, there's another statistic that I thought I would share with you. And, and this has to do with something we call refractory um, seizures, meaning they as seizures that don't respond to our uh, typical medicines. And sadly, this has not changed a lot in my career. Um, the number, if we ask the question, how many people respond optimally? And that means becoming seizure-free. Uh, from that very first medicine, uh, it's maybe only about 50% or so. And then if we ask, well, how many patients, you know, even if I go to multiple medicines, eventually become, you know, seizure-free? Well, maybe we can get that number up to 70 or so percent. So sadly, about 30% of patients with epilepsy that are out there continue to have seizures. And this is one reason that we're constantly in search of new drugs, new uh, combinations of medicines, and in, in patients who have difficulty with medicines, looking at new delivery uh, devices for existing medicines. And we'll talk about what I mean by that in a minute. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, let me talk about Lennox-Gastaut. Now again, we uh, I, I personally don't like the term that we talk about rare, 
because I think Lennox gastro is a little bit more common than we uh, commonly hear about, um, but it is severe. And I think everyone who's uh, listening to this broadcast tonight probably already knows that, um, that Lennox gastro is severe. Um, and it can be uh, encompass multiple seizure types um, and typically are very refractory, meaning they don't respond to maybe one, two, or three of our different anti-seizure medications. Well, how many people um, uh, suffer from Lennox Gesto? It's hard to, you know, um, put a number to it. It is a smaller percentage of the total population of people with epilepsy, but it's not an insignificant number. Now, I will tell you, again, I think uh, this number may be an underrepresentation because we know just because of, you know, I think we're getting better, but the people, the kids that maybe never got the, uh, the diagnosis um, or they grew up and maybe parents are no longer around to pass on that information, um, then get seen by an adult neurologist. And more importantly, some of the um, diagnostics we use, such as the electroencephalogram, it actually changes um, when kids uh, with Lennox Gasteau or LGS grow into adults with LGS. And so sometimes it's, uh, the diagnosis doesn't get put correctly affixed to the patient. So the point, the reason I'm, I, I'm just telling you this, that you know, if you are caring for a loved one, an adult, um, with bad epilepsy um, that doesn't seem to respond to you, medications, maybe you've gone through a number of different medications. Um, they also have some developmental delays or cognitive disability, intellectual disability. Sadly, um, a lot of patients uh, will never, they, they will have some cognitive deficit, sometimes severe. Um, so if you have an adult that has that uh, pattern, it's worth bringing this up with the provider. Could this be, and especially if you have a good history of all the different medicines that they tried over, the, over their lifetime. Now, I mentioned EEG, the electroencephalogram. There is a characteristic, if you will, signature um, EEG when somebody is younger. Um, but for reasons we don't entirely understand, as you grow up, that EEG changes. Now, it won't be normal. Patients with Lennox Gusto will not have a normal looking EEG. So this is an important point, but they won't have one that necessarily is um, stereotypical for patients with L LGS. So again, um, patient, these are the usual three signs of Lennox Gusto, but not all patients, especially the adults will have them. Well, I've already kind of mentioned this, you know, one of the challenges of our patients with Lennox Gusto is that these things don't tend to get better. Um, they will, could have lifelong uh, social uh, difficulties, intellectual difficulties, problems being able to even independently live, and they're gonna be heavily reliant on other people uh, for help. So this truly is a lifelong um, syndrome. Um, one thing we know that for those that are uh, parents or caregivers for kids, um, we don't know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to predict any given child how they will eventually do, but we do know that some of these uh, mood issues um, and intellectual deficits will actually get worse as time goes on. So that's a little bit of background. Again, if I'm talking to a group here uh, this evening that um, is caring for someone with Lennox Gesto, I think there's probably a lot of this rings very familiar. So let me, let me um, shift gears just a little bit here, and let me talk about some of the challenges of, of medications and of treatment of this. Well, I've already mentioned this, that um, it's sort of characteristic of Lennox Gasto that no single drug is a magic bullet. No single drug is gonna control seizures completely. Um, however, that doesn't change our goal of if it's possible um, to have eventually get to a point of no seizures or very few seizures, minimize them as much as we can. Um, but we'll also we got a balancing act of trying to keep um, side effects in check. So it's no seizures, no side effects is our goal. But if it's possible, um, we're 
we'll do the best we can, but let's minimize side effects and let's do what we can to maintain quality of life. And I would say maintain quality of life not only for the patient, but let's maintain quality of life for the family unit that's helping uh, support that individual. Now, one of the things that we're going to, you know, that's a, there's a lot of things we can't control um, about uh, treatment issues, some things we can't control. Um, but one thing that we do know is a problem, and this is not just a problem um, in Lennox Gaston. This is a problem across all patients with epilepsy. And this is an, an older um, paper by Joyce Kramer. Um, this was not with Len, uh, Lennox Gaston. Um, it was as patients with epilepsy. And it's this issue of something in the old days we called it medication compliance. We now use the term medication adherence. But it's, and this was, these were independently functioning patients. About three quarters of them, just about, reported that they, uh, at some point, you know, during the, during the month, they forget or they skip a dose of their seizure um, medication. Um, for any of you that are out there taking medicines, we know, myself included, this is a hard thing to do to remember every single day. Well, one thing we know about people with bad epilepsy and very difficult to control epilepsy, um, this can have significant consequences. Uh, missing a dose or two or three doses can, uh, can cause problems. In fact, in this study of Kramer's of uh, general patients with epilepsy, um, almost half those patients um, reported that after not taking just a, a dose, a single dose of their seizure medicine, um, that they could, would, could possibly have a seizure. Now, here's the problem with communication. This is my next point tonight. For us to, we need to all work together. Um, we're going to achieve this goal of no seizures, no side effects. There needs to be good communication between the patient, caregiver, and the care um, provider and the, the clinician, uh, be that the physician, nurse, and pharmacist. But, you know, this is one of the more telling things, this last statistic here, that about a third of people, um, only about a third of people, I should say, had told their doctor about when they missed doses. And this kind of sometimes can be a problem. Um, um, I understand it. Uh, people don't want to, sometimes the way uh, clinicians will ask the question, you know, in a manner of, well, you didn't miss any medicines, did you? That that can be difficult and intimidating. But um, understand that the point behind the question is, we need to know, it's important to know if there is any missed doses because to respond to those seizures about adjusting medications, it's really important to know uh, before we embark on that, whether or not they're in missed doses. So again, this is where a seizure diary can be incredibly helpful for those who don't uh, necessarily have one. Um, I can suggest going to epilepsy.com and you can download seizure diaries from there and uh, keep that information because that's okay. Everyone's human. We understand that people are going uh, to miss doses of their medicine occasionally. But we need to know, because sometimes in some people it won't necessarily be an immediate problem, but it's a problem that can add up. Okay, move on here. Now let's talk about some other medication challenges. Um, you know, um, again, I mentioned a lot of people have trouble taking medicines. Just taking a, a big tablet or a, a capsule um, can be a difficulty, especially if you have difficulty um, swallowing. Well, for when we talk now about things such as Lennox Gastaut or any patient that we're caring for that has swallowing difficulties or possibly um, behavioral issues where they, they simply don't want to take their medicines. And we know that sometimes patients with significant intellectual disabilities or frankly some patients um, that just sometimes when they don't feel well, they don't feel good, they can resist and they can fight back about taking medicines. It can be quite the challenge. And uh, what a lot of people do is simply crush up uh, their tablet and try to mix it in food uh, for patients. Now that, that can work, but not all of our drugs, our anti-seizure medications um, are designed to be able to do that. And that can actually cause a problem sometime in how the drug um, didn't get absorbed, it gets absorbed. The other problem with that is in this one particular survey, 
that about half of the kids, when this was done, was crushing up the, the, the pill and putting in the food, didn't finish their food. And uh, for those who know that, you know, try to do this, um, sometimes, again, that can be a difficult, time-consuming battle. So again, um, to help assure that, you know, we try to control seizures as best we can, we need to make sure that all the dose gets in. So that, that poses a problem. That's, that's a logistical challenge that, that folks have to face. So we also, you know, know, again, like mentioned this, that, you know, um, some kids just, you know, refuse to take their medication. Um, this is not just kids with Lennox Gasto, but all children. And again, it can, as, it can be a battle trying to get that full dose of medication in. So this is gonna lead me into a discussion. So what, what do we necessarily do about that? What do we do about when we have this sort of, you know, myriad of issues? We have a patient, maybe they have swallowing difficulty. The term there is dysphagia. Um, this happens, by the way, in not just um, people with Lennox Gasto, but some of my older patients who've had strokes, who have difficulty swallowing. Um, and then they're combined with this with frequent seizures. And again, I will refer to my, my older patients um, that they uh, may have some dementia. And having dementia sometimes will get the same types of, of, of behaviors and the difficulties of trying to get medicine in. So again, um, I think when I'm speaking um, to caregivers out there, I, am, I think as I'm preaching to the choir, I think this is something that people probably already, already know, and it's, it's a daily challenge. So the task before us then is, okay, so what can we do? Remember I said that, you know, we're continually trying to find not only new medications that work differently to try to treat seizures, but take some of our older medicines that we know can be very effective. And how, what can we do to help get that medicine in and to make it more effective ultimately for our patients, but also make life a little bit um, easier for caregivers. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, I wanna shift gears. I'm gonna get back to that theme um, in a couple seconds, but I, I do wanna talk about um, some other sort of treatment specific things now when we talk about Lennox Casto. And something that again, for this audience, I'm sure there's a lot of folks that have either heard about or they've tried or they're curious about, and that's the ketogenic diet. Um, what is the ketogenic diet? It is a very, very, very high fat, very, very, very low carbohydrate diet. Um, you know, we've known about this, actually, there's been hints about it to go back into antiquity, but it was really formally sort of main, uh, developed, if you will, back in the 1920s um, as a actual treatment modality. And when I say um, very high fat, it's almost exclusively fat based for their nutrition and virtually no carbohydrates. Even tiny amounts of carbohydrate um, will negate to some degree the effectiveness of the ketogenic diet. And it has a little bit of protein in it too. So for those who have tried this, um, you know that it can be a challenge, it can be difficult, and it's difficult to find, um, not only to arrange the diet, but also when other medicines need to be taken uh, because again, for, for patients who have some difficulty swallowing or have difficulty getting things in, some of the common dose forms that we have have sugar in them or some sort of carbohydrate or different liquids have flavoring in them that uh, tends to have a little bit of carbohydrate. Um, even things such as some toothpaste um, have enough carbohydrate in them to um, offset some of the benefits of this. But the ketogenic diet, it can be an incredibly um, effective therapy in certain patients. So I would encourage uh, folks, if you've never thought about that, um, to have that, again, have that conversation uh, with your neurologist. There's other um, treatments in addition to medications that are out there. Uh, the vagus nerve uh, stimulator. This is a, a device that's surgically implanted under the skin. It's got coils that are wrapped around the vagus nerve. Um, and this is sort of a programmable device. It sends uh, pulses, impulses upwards from your neck upward to the brain. And um, VNS is an interesting technology. Um, it 
can re reduce seizures in maybe 20, 30 percent of patients. Uh, or 20, it can reduce, let me restate that, can reduce seizures by 20 or 30 percent in selected patients. Um, it's interesting enough, VNS, unlike some medicines that can work fairly quickly, uh, VNS sometimes takes a little bit longer to see the effect, um, but it can be a very viable non-medical treatment option. So it's most certainly an option if you've exhausted all the different drug avenues, things like ketogenic diet, it's certainly a, a conversation to have with your provider. Now, let me just uh, talk now. There's uh, a few drugs that are out there that we have good clinical evidence, good clinical trial data and have some degree of FDA approval uh, to be used to treat the seizures associated with Lennox Gastaut. Uh, there's some older drugs such as Lamotrigine, Rafinamide, Topiramate, uh, Felbamate. Um, there's some brand new drugs that I'm sure most people uh, in this, in this uh, audience have probably heard about it to some degree, and that's the cannabinoids, cannabidiol. Um, we do have a prescription uh, form of cannabidiol. There's another FDA-approved uh, treatment, um, fenfluramine, that just became available. So there's some newer drug treatments that are out there. But I want to talk about um, a drug tonight that is, in some respects, it's a new drug. In most respects, it's an old drug. And that's clobazam, which is a benzodiazepine drug. Um, so it's, it's um, really in the same family as drugs such as uh, diazepam or Valium, um, lorazepam, Ativan, or midazolam. Now, why do I say it's an old drug? Well, actually, this drug was first um, really started being used in Europe and then into Canada in the 70s and 80s um, for a lot of reasons, none of them having really to do with efficacy or side effects um, because it, it went off patent and it just needed to be uh, picked up by another company. It really did not get a, it did not get FDA approval until 2011 in the United States. Um, but nonetheless, this is a drug that we have decades long um, proven experience uh, with this medication. Um, and so this is a um, a valuable medicine um, to add on. Now, uh, unlike some of the med the other medicines in its class that I talked about like diazepam or lorazepam or midazolam that we pretty much use only as a rescue uh, therapy. Clobazam is really designed to be taken daily, a chronic medicine is designed to be taken chronically. So those are some of the general treatment options. Now I wanna get back to my theme here of, of what can we do you know, to address some of the specific challenges that we have in, in patients with bad epilepsy, like LGS. And this issue of being able to get medicines in or people who have trouble taking oral, traditional swallowing a tablet or a capsule um, oral medicine. And that leads us now to um, Sympazam, which is Clobazam, but it's um, Clobazam reformulated, redesigned, if you will, to be in an oral film. And I'll describe a little bit what that is. Um, this is a, a fairly new um, technology in terms of delivering medicines. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen these oral strips uh, before for different things, such as um, you know, uh, air, uh, breath fresheners and other things. It's a technology that was developed where you could take a drug or a medicine, and this drug could be put on the tongue, or in some cases in the side of the of the, the cheek but it really could be put on the tongue. And this drug, the, the drug that's in that teeny slip, strip, and you can see from the image here, really what size I'm uh, describing here. It's teeny tiny and it will dissolve. Now, um, this formulation of Clobazam has been studied um, and it's now also FDA approved. So it went through clinical trials, um, it's also now it has the same approvals as it, for those that are familiar with oral clobazam, uh, either the brand name Monfi or the generic uh, formulation of clobazam for seizures associated with LGS in kids two years or older. Um, we just don't know um, about efficacy in uh, kids less than two. 
And that doesn't mean that I'm worried about it being safe or not effective. It's just simply that the studies have not been done. So I can't recommend um, using it in very, very uh, little children. So there are some things I just would quickly point out if you're not familiar with this. Um, if this has clobazam or symphazam, has the same uh, general safety warnings um, and side effect profile as do, does the regular oral tablet uh, formulation. So what are the things that it can do? It can cause sleepiness um, and drowsiness. Um, there is a concern that we have for all the benzodiazepine medicines in this category of breathing problems, respiratory depression, when people combine this with narcotics, in particular with opiates. Um, we've really known that for a long time, but I think with the opiate crisis that we're facing in the United States now, we've seen more cases come up. So um, I want to really emphasize that this, this drug, um, if, if you have, are caring for a patient, um, of whatever age that is on chronic narcotic medicines, really have a long conversation with your doctor before using any um, type of benzodiazepine. Um, and that would also say combining this with other medicines that can make you sleepy or dizzy, this medicine can contribute to that. So who is this? Why was this? Why did the company Equest have designed this? Well, this really uh, filled an unmet need. Again, we know that clobazam is incredibly effective and it can be very, very useful medicine for us, but there's some patients who just simply couldn't do it for all those reasons um, we talked about before. So whether patients, you know, have trouble swallowing, um, some of our patients with LGS have a lot of drooling issues or they tend to spit out foods. Um, we already talked about the problems with trying to crush things up and mix it with food. And they wanted something that's a little bit more convenient uh, to give. And really, Symphazan um, filled that niche uh, quite nice. So, um, in you know, getting back to the the efficacy of Clobazam, um, and again, what what I want to emphasize for because some people have asked, well, okay, so this new strip, is it going to work as well as the pill? Does it work as well as the tablet? Um, the studies have been done, shown, have been done, I should say, and shown that when you put this um, strip of film on your tongue, again, it dissolves really fast. You don't need to drink water uh, to make it go down. Um, and once it's on the tongue, by the way, it's virtually impossible to spit this thing out. That um, it's something we call the pharmacokinetics, or if we measure in the bloodstream um, how quickly it gets in, how much of it gets in, um, it looked identical to the tablet, to the pill form of clobazam. And again, if we know going back to the efficacy of clobazam in patients with Lennox Gasto, um, that, that study um, can reduce, uh, studies have shown, multiple studies have shown that clobazam can reduce uh, seizure frequency by 40 to almost 70%. So again, putting all that all together, I know I've shown a lot of uh, numbers and statistics at you, but we know that Clobazam works in Lennox Gasto, we know the tablets work, and now we have this new strip that I have as a clinician know that if I put this on a patient's tongue, it's gonna get absorbed and get in the body just as well um, as the tablet, and it's gonna be a whole lot easier in, in certain patients. So this is a... Um, um, th this is just a cartoon uh, or an image, I suppose, to show you again what that the size of that strip, what that looks like. It comes in multiple different strengths, which is um, useful. Um, that you know, so being able to um, identify um, different doses or customize uh, doses for uh, different patients, it makes it very easy um, using this strip. Um, so, folks, uh, is, I, I, I need to ho I hope there's not an interruption here. I'm filming this uh, from my home, and there are people outside, so I apologize if you hear noise. Um, so, again, being able to customize this. It also uh, comes in a thin uh, berry-flavored um, uh, strip. So, um, what I have heard, I have uh, tried the, the, the demo of this. Um, it is... Um, 
pleasant tasting. And when I talk to parents of patients with um, epilepsy that are taking this strip, that um, kids and patients seem to like it, okay? Important point here, it dissolves without water or other liquids. Now, I mentioned this, that um, it comes in multiple um, strengths so we can individualize doses. Um, and it comes uh, from, you know, from a convenience point of view, it comes wrapped in a choil resistant uh, foil pouch. So again, in all those side effects that I told you about, you may say, gee, I'm kind of worried. I don't want to get this out for a kid. A little person can get into it. Um, you really, it's, it would be very difficult for a child to be able to open these strips. But the nice thing about these strips are that you can carry them with you. They're very, very thin. Um, so it's a very convenient, it's not a, having to carry a big uh, pill vial around with you. And again, this is just a, an image of what this comes in. It comes in these different packs and you can discuss that with your pharmacist um, about getting these, um, these packs. So what do I want you to know about this? So this is a branded medication. This is not a generic. That's the other question that sometimes comes up. Is this just a generic clobazam? No, it's not. There is no generic substitute for this particular strip. Um, it's the only um, uh, product formulation like this. Um, so if you are interested in this, just to make sure there's no confusion with your healthcare provider um, or uh, at the pharmacy, make sure you use the brand name so they know exactly what you're talking about, um, Sympazam. Um, and there are um, uh, programs that are available to help, especially in this time of, of COVID, um, to help people with some financial issues um, to be able to get um, a hold of that. And uh, your healthcare provider or pharmacist in particular should be able to help you navigate that. Now, there is some important um, safety things. I think I've talked about this. This is a controlled substance. Um, and like any anti-seizure medication, any medication, we always worry about mood changes um, and things like suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation. Now, this is not a prominent problem that was identified with Sympazam. Um, but again, these kind of things, these mood changes can happen anytime we add a new medicine um, to somebody. So someone who's, say, never taken clobazam before, we always want to monitor for mood. So my advice to you is when starting any or stopping, in fact, any different anti-seizure medication, if you note a change in mood, please contact your healthcare provider and have that conversation. Okay, and again, have that conversation with your uh, uh, your physician or your uh, child or your significant others or your loved one's physician about any other um, medical issues that they may have. So I think we've already uh, touched on this about the major side effects. The major side effects that I see in my practice when I use Clobazam is a little bit of sleepiness. Um, the uh, that there's other problems that I've listed here that are the most common that we're seeing in the in the clinical trials, um, but again, sleepiness and sometimes drooling, um, especially my patients with um, that have some cognitive difficulties are usually uh, the most common. But again, every patient is a little bit different. So um, what I strongly suggest is have a conversation. If you're interested in, in trying uh, uh, Clobazam or any of these medications, and frankly, any of the medications that I mentioned earlier, have that conversation with your, your doctor and have it again um, when you go to pick up your prescription from the pharmacist. Um, have them go over side effects. Write things down if you weren't clear on what some of the things that you were told and have the conversation. Again, I emphasized earlier, have good communication. Um, is critical. Um, and this is the only way we're going to be able to provide the optimal care. I would also say once starting a new medication, whether it's Clobazam or any other drug, some side effects here that I might say are relatively rare, they may not be rare if they occur in your patient. So note things down. We tend to see most side effects for newer medicines happen within the very first days to a few weeks of starting a medication. So if anything begins to be different, any be different behaviors, 
um, changes in mood, changes in level of arousal, um, sleepiness, um, any of those things. Write them down in your seizure um, diary, and especially in relationship to what time you gave the medication, and bring that in. Have again, have that conversation with your doctor and your pharmacist. Okay, I want to circle back here for a couple minutes before we finish up. I mentioned ketogenic diet um, early on. Um, and I also mentioned that it can be very effective for uh, severe seizures and epilepsies, such as LGS. Um, and again, I said it's very restrictive on carbohydrates, usually no more than about eight grams or so daily uh, of carbohydrate. So we need to be a very mindful of that. For those of you that um, have someone who's on ketogenic diet, you already know this. Um, and you need to, as I mentioned, uh, medicines, different oral uh, dosage forms of medicines have some carbohydrate in them. So there's good news about Symphazan. This is one reason the Symphazan kind of fits very nicely into this sort of a medication regimen, is that you can see here on this chart that if you look at the amount of um, carbohydrate, especially at the higher doses um, of like, say, the suspension, which I know a lot of people will, will use in somebody who's having some swallowing difficulties or a kid. Um, and even on the uh, branded Onfi tablets versus Sympazan has virtually none. So again, if you're counting carbs in this type in your patient, um, this gives you a little bit of latitude and a little bit of flexibility. So um, there's other things that are available uh, for you here, for those who are interested in the ketogenic diet, there's the Keto Diet Calculator um, found on Charlie's uh, web, uh, Foundation website. So the web's listed there, the keto, KetoDietCalculator.org. Um, and if you're looking to count up the carbohydrates and be able to figure out um, carbs and different things, the Sympazan strip is now listed on there. All right, the last thing I want to talk about, I'm going to get back to uh, to finish this off this evening, getting back to the challenges. Um, I mentioned a couple times um, seizure diaries. This can be one of the most important pieces of information that we can have as providers, um, knowing what, how many seizures, but knowing when they occurred, did they tend to cluster? This is something that can happen in, in folks with bad epilepsy that sometimes you can get a flurry of seizures, meaning multiple seizures within a 24 hour period of time. Uh, that's concerning to us. And there's different treatments that we can embark upon there. Um, triggers um, for different seizures, um, it's important to know. And again, missed doses or difficulty getting the full dose um, in. All that information, none of it is, is trivial. It all should be included in your seizure diary. And the more information we have, um, the better. But I also want to talk about another thing, another uh, thing that I would hope everybody on listening to this uh, talk tonight has, and that's a seizure action plan. So the seizure diary gives us information of how treatments are going. The seizure action plan is really to help you and to help your provider sort of map out, as it states, an, a plan, what to do. Um, there is a copy of it on this slide, but you can go to epilepsy.com and search. There's the website that's on there. Search for seizure action plan. This can be downloaded. Um, and it gives some uh, tips on first aid for seizures, when you should and should not necessarily go to the emergency department. Um, it's information that you can write down and have copies, whether it's uh, for uh, you, um, if you have seizures, then maybe have a copy at work, um, have it posted on the refrigerator, leave it with school teachers, leave, you know, wh whoever, uh, pro uh, child care providers, so people know. Because again, epilepsy treatment is individualized. And this, in addition to the seizure diary, this is an important plan for you. This is important information um, for you to have. So I, I strongly um, encourage everybody to please have an action, download this action plan, and then arrange at your next visit with your healthcare provider to have that discussion about what should we or should we not be doing. 
Um, and if seizures do cluster, for example, talk to your healthcare provider. That's beyond the scope of tonight's uh, talk to talk about seizure clusters. But if there is things like, you know, boy, my 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 child or my uh, my significant other has these flurries and bouts of seizures, um, you know, is there something we can do about that? Have those conversations. Again, bring the seizure diary and fill out the seizure action. So again, I want to thank you for your um, attention uh, this evening. Um, I'd be happy for those that are on the call uh, this evening to um, answer some questions. And thank you for your time. Well, Dr. Goodall, I don't see any questions that have been submitted. But thank you so much, uh, those who are able to join us tonight. Uh, and thank you for Aquesta for sponsoring this talk. And thank you, Dr. Goodall, for all the information on LGS and Sympazan. Okay, well, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night.